Laws of power, law two. Don't put too much trust into friends. Learn how to use your enemies. Be wary of friends. They will betray you more quickly for they are easily aroused to envy. They also become spoiled and tyrannical. But hire a former enemy and he will be more loyal than a friend because he has more to prove. In fact, you have more to fear from friends than from enemies. If you have no enemies, find a way to make them. Observance in Suits Mike Ross never went to law school. His former best friend Trevor is put on the stand to testify that Mike never went to law school. Their history is complicated, but what's more important to know is that Mike started dating Jenny, which is the ex-girlfriend of Trevor, after they broke up. If Mike loses this trial, he'll be sent to jail. Claims to have attended Harvard. Yes, we shared an apartment at 5307 Huntington Boulevard in Brooklyn. He worked as a bike messenger and made money on the side taking the LSATs for people. Why would he have to resort to that if he were a college graduate? Because he wasn't a college graduate. He was kicked out of college for cheating on a test. Isn't it possible that he went back to school and completed his degree? Well, I don't see how, since most of his spare time is spent sitting around smoking weed with me. Well, let me get this straight. Is it at all possible that Mike Ross ever attended Harvard Law School? Not unless I had a satellite campus at 5307 Huntington Boulevard in Brooklyn. No more questions, Your Honor. Given that you smoked all this pot, Mr. Evans, isn't it possible that if Mike Ross commuted one day a week to Harvard Law that you might not remember that? I'd remember. Yeah, maybe you would, but you'd lie through your teeth about it anyway, wouldn't you? You wouldn't lie just to get out of going to prison. No, I would not. Well, how about if the other reason was to get back at someone you've been jealous of your entire life? I've never been jealous of Mike Ross in my entire life. And I just caught you in a lie. Mr. Evans, my next move is going to be to call Jenny Griffith to the stand. She left you for Mike Ross. Objection, badgering. She's also going to say that you were jealous of his mind your entire life. And when you found out that she left you for him, you were as jealous as a human being can be. Now, is that true or not? Your Honor. Let me rephrase. Is Miss Griffith going to be perjuring herself, or are you? Yeah, I was jealous of him. And if he lied about all of that, what's to make us believe that he wasn't lying about everything else? But this wasn't the only time that he got envious. When Trevor found out about Jenny and Mike, he went to Mike's law firm to expose him. Miss Pearson, I'm Trevor Evans. I'm a friend of Mike Ross. Yes. I wish I didn't have to do this. I want to know how my best friend could do this to me. Do what to you? Huh? Betray you? Go behind your back? I... Okay, yeah, you got me. Jenny broke up with me, but you went to my boss. You tried to ruin my life. Or even. You often do not know your friends as well as you imagine. They cover up their unpleasant qualities to not offend you. Always be on the lookout for any signs of emotional disturbance, such as envy and ingratitude. Keys to power. It is natural to want to employ your friends when you find yourself in times of need. Friends often agree on things in order to avoid an argument. The problem with using or hiring friends is that it will inevitably limit your power. The friend is really the one who is most able to help you. And in the end, skill and competence are far more important than friendly feelings. All working situations require a kind of distance between people. You are trying to work, not to make friends. Friendliness, real or false, only obscures that fact. The keys to power, then, is the ability to judge who is best able to further your interest in all situations. Keep friends for friendship, but work with the skilled and competent. Your enemies, on the other hand, are an untapped gold mine that you must learn to exploit. It wasn't me who pissed him off. It was you, Frank Gallo. Holy shit. I put him away for racketeering. I pulled the string and you came. You owe me 13 years. I'm gonna collect. What do you want, Gallo? I already have what I want, which is knowing that every time your phone rings, you're gonna ask yourself, is this the call where you find out that the guy who's in here for you is never coming out? Get it! Listen to me, you son of a bitch. You think I can't hurt you in here? I'll put a goddamn bounty on your head. I'll pay him whatever it takes to break your legs. And if that doesn't work, I'll wait till you get out and I'll kill you myself. Don't you ever even look at Mike Ross again.
Ring, ring, counselor. Whenever you can, bury the hatchet with an enemy and make a point of putting him in your service. Better be convincing up there. Gallo, I'm about to sell my soul to make us even, so sit down and shut up. Gallo uses the situation to strike a deal. If Harvey can get him out, he won't hurt Mike and even protect him for the time being. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, Mr. Gallo has served 12 years as an exemplary inmate. We ask that you release him so he can continue to live his life outside these walls. So Gallo used this enemy to better his position by creating a win-win situation. Guys, remember, a person who has something to prove will move mountains for you. The relationship with former enemies can be based on mutual self-interest and therefore will not be contaminated by personal feeling. Man, don't look much better. But without yeah, enemies better. around us, we grow lazy. An enemy at our heels sharpens our wits, keeping us focused and alert. It is sometimes better than to use enemies as enemies rather than transforming them into friends or allies. Never let the presence of enemies upset or distress you. You are far better off with a declared opponent or two than not knowing where your real enemies lie. The man of power welcomes conflict using enemies to enhance his reputation as a sure-footed fighter who can be relied upon in times of uncertainty. Defiance of the law in the mid 9th century, a young man named Michael III assumed the throne of the Byzantine Empire. Michael was a young, inexperienced ruler surrounded by intriguers, murderers and profligates. He needed someone to trust. Ignoring the advice of those who recommended the much more qualified Bardas, who was also his uncle, Michael chose his best friend Basilius, who had no experience whatsoever in government politics. Basilius learned well and was soon advising the emperor on all matters of the state. The only problem seemed to be money. Basilius never had enough. Michael doubled, then tripled his salary, ennobled him and married him off to his own mistress. But more trouble was to come. Basilius convinced Michael to kill off his uncle Bardas, who was the head of the army. And later on, he took Bardas' position. Now, Basilius' power and wealth only grew. A few years later, Michael asked him to pay back some of the money he had borrowed over the years. To Michael's shock and astonishment. Basilius refused with such an impudent smile that Michael realized his mistake. Soon, Michael awoke to find himself surrounded by soldiers and Basilius watched as they stabbed the emperor to death. Then, after proclaiming himself emperor, he rode his horse through the streets of Byzantium, brandishing the head of the former benefactor and best friend at the end of a long pike. Interpretation Michael III staked his future on the sense of gratitude he thought Basilius must feel for him. He owed his emperor his wealth, his education and his position. But instead of a grateful friend, he had created a monster. He had allowed a man to see power up close, a man who then wanted more, who asked for anything and got it. He had received and simply did what many people do in such situation. They forget the favors they have received and imagine they have earned their success by their own merits. Nobody believes a friend can betray. And Michael went on disbelieving until the day his head ended up on a pike. People want to feel they deserve their good fortune. The receipt of a favor from friends can become oppressive. It means you have been chosen because you are a friend, not necessarily because you are deserving. There is almost a touch of condescension in the act of hiring friends. You should deliberate very thoroughly before you start an endeavor like that with a friend. Observance of the law. Chinese history. A pattern of violent and bloody coups, one after the other, army men would plot to kill a weak emperor, then would replace him on the dragon throne with a strong general. The general would start a new dynasty and crown himself emperor. 
To ensure his own survival, he would kill off his fellow generals, and then this pattern would repeat endlessly. To be emperor of China was to be alone, surrounded by a pack of enemies. It was the least powerful, least secure position in the realm. Until 1959, General Chao Kuan Yin became Emperor Sung. He knew the odds, the probability that within a year or two, he would be murdered. How could he break this pattern? Sung ordered a banquet to celebrate the new dynasty and invited the most powerful commanders in the army. After they had drunk much wine, he dismissed the guards and everybody else except the generals who now feared he would murder them all in one fell swoop. Instead, he stood up. The whole day is spent in fear and I am unhappy. For which one of you does not dream of ascending the throne? Drunk and fearing for their lives, the generals proclaimed their innocence and their loyalty. But some had other ideas. The best way to pass one's day is in the peaceful enjoyment of riches and honor. If you are willing to give up your commands, I am ready to provide you with fine estates, singers and girls as your companions. The astonished generals realized that instead of a life of anxiety and struggles, Song was offering them riches and security. The next day, all of the generals tendered their resignations and retired. In one stroke, Sung turned a pack of friendly wolves who would likely have betrayed them into a group of docile lambs, far from all power. Instead of relying on friends, Sung used his enemies. While a friend expects more and more favors and sees with jealousy, these former enemies expected nothing and got everything. And thus Sung was finally able to break the pattern of coups, violence and civil war. The Sung dynasty ruled China for more than 300 years. Now that's a sweet way of applying the law. Reversal of the law. Robert Greene writes, Although it is generally best to not mix work with friendship, there are times when a friend can be used to greater effect than an enemy. A man of power, for example, often has dirty work that has to be done. But for the sake of appearances, it is generally preferable to have other people do it for him. Friends often do this the best, since their affection for him makes them willing to take chances. Another application is if your plans go awry. You can use a friend as a convenient scapegoat. This fall for the favorite was a trick often used by kings and sovereigns. The public would not believe that they would deliberately sacrifice a friend for such a purpose. Of course, after you play that card, you have lost your friend forever. It is best then to reserve the scapegoat rule for someone who is close to you, but not too close. Finally. The problem about working with friends is that it confuses the boundaries and distance that work requires. But if both parties in the arrangement understand the dangers involved, a friend can often be employed to great effect. You must never let your guard down in such a venture, however. Always be on the lookout for any signs of emotional disturbance such as envy and ingratitude. Nothing is stable in the realm of power, and even the closest of friends can be transformed into the worst of enemies.